love this talk. I am so glad that Steubenville gave me four hours to tell you everything I wanted to tell you in this talk. Um, I just, I don't know what the plan is. Sister told me I could do whatever. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I just want you to know how much you're loved. And this is going to be a fun talk. I'm going to throw a lot out there. Take what, take what you want. Take what applies to you right now. But the title of this talk is Femininity Restored. Femininity Restored. I can't say it very well, so just remember the title, okay? Femininity Restored, all right? This is a hard talk to give. I'm just going to be honest. It just is. Because there's so much confusion and there's so much doubt and despair when it comes to, right, all of this. So the scripture that they gave us for this is from Genesis. And it's a beauty. Ready? Maybe you've heard it before. Then the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helpmate. So out of the ground, the Lord God formed every animal of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to the cattle, to the birds of the air, and to every animal of the field. But for the man, there was not found a helper as his partner. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. This one shall be called woman, for out of man this one was taken. Therefore, a man leaves his father and his mother and clings to his wife, and they become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Genesis 2. When we say the word restored, right, that means brought back to its original state. This was God's original plan for man and woman. Did you hear it? Did you see it? I mean, even just reading it slowly, it's like, yes, like, yes. But it's gotten complicated, right? It's gotten a little messy. And for us women, it's hard because we question everything. When I came out here and I was like, femininity restored, and like, you know, we come out and it's like, oh, I love being, don't you love being a woman? Isn't it the greatest, right? Like, oh my gosh, like, privilege of being a woman, like feminine genius, like hear me roar, right? Like, so great. I think it's hard. Anybody else? Like, I think, I mean, like I hear all those things. I'm like, yeah, hashtag goals, right? But I'm also like, oh, okay, up in my head, no. My guess is that you hear instead of like, oh, yeah, I love this so much. It's so great. I bet you hear more things like this. I'm not enough. I will never be enough if only I had if only I could get their attention, if only they could see me, then I'd. No one will ever love me and accept me, especially now that I've. She's got everything she wants. All she has to do is snap her fingers and. It's so easy for them. They don't have to deal with. Do you ever think like that? I mean, we don't talk like that, right? We don't say it out loud, but we think those things sometimes. When I first started doing ministry, I was a dorm director, like a house mom, like a dorm mom, for 142 freshman college women in St. Scholastica Hall in, at Benedictine. And that was one of the things that I saw over and over again is just how many women were battling on the inside but had no one to go to with it, who were thinking all these things but had no one to talk to. And it was the joy of my heart to get to walk with those women. And it's the joy of my heart to get to walk with you but I want to start this talk out with um, just this video that rocks me. And that you guys, this video is from 2006. I saw it when I was like right out of college and it rocked me. And so I just want you to take in this video. I just want you to see this video.
I'm going to have them show it one more time. I want you to watch her, especially at the end, I want you to watch her eyes and her neck, okay? Do you guys mind playing it one more time for me? Oh, they're so great back there. Give it up for those cool guys back there that you can't see. Repeat after me. I will not compete with what is not real. Amen. Take a deep breath in. Let it out, right? This was 2006. What do you think they're capable of in 2021? That was like simple Photoshop. When you're scrolling, you guys, like you're beating yourself up over things that aren't real. It's hard. Competition is real. I feel it for you. I have a mad love for Joanna Gaines. Any JoJo fans out there? I love me some JoJo. Yeah. But like you guys, I follow her. I was following her on Instagram and I was like watching the show and I just, I love her. Everything she touches is gold, right? But like I had to unfollow her on, on Instagram for a while because I started noticing that like I would like see her stuff and I would like put my phone down and I look around my house and I'd be like, I think I just need to burn it down and start over, right? Like... What was I thinking? Like, this is a train wreck, right? Like, and I would just look around and I'd be like, gosh. And it had nothing to do with sweet JoJo. JoJo's just, she's just rocking it, trying to help us pick curtains and rugs. And I'm like, really, really grateful for her, right? Like, it's not JoJo, it's me. Because what I started to realize is I would look around my house and I, what I would feel is ungrateful. What I would feel is like, because for some reason, because like, I, like my, I wasn't doing this right or it wasn't enough, then all of a sudden I wasn't enough. And it hit me really hard one day, you guys, because I was like, dang, if I feel this way about knickknacks in my house, how do they feel about themselves? You guys, I went through junior high, high school, college, got engaged, got married, had Thomas and Fulton before I sent a text message or even knew what social media was. I'm 38, not 88. You're like, she looks so good for 55, right? You all just had this like moment, right? Like, I come to you because I am so proud of you. I am so proud of your fight. But like a mama bear, I'm also like going to take on every single lie in your head right now. Because I don't want you to listen to the lies. Do you remember when I said, remember, inhale truth, exhale lies? Like there are so many lies in your head. And here's the, here's the problem. We forget who we are. Amen? We forget who we are. I want to remind you of who you are. You're the daughter. You're the beloved daughter. So love that God the Father created you out of love, completely unique and unrepeatable. So love that God the Father gave his only begotten son to suffer and die on a cross to save you from sin and death. So love that God the Father raised Christ from the dead so that you might have eternal life with him forever. And so love that God the Father promised never to abandon you and proved it by sending the Holy Spirit to always be with you for you are never alone. There is only one you completely unique and unrepeatable. Someone said to me the other day, you were born an original copy, don't die a, pho a photocopy, amen? I was like, that's so good. Women are, when are, women are weird, right? Like if you have long hair, you want straight hair. If you have straight hair, you want curly hair. If you have big boobs, you want small boobs. If you have a big butt, you want a big, you want a small butt. If you're tall, you want to be shorter. I, I literally would sit in a dorm and watch women with curly hair straighten it. Like the girl would straighten the hair and then the girl would turn and then she would curl her hair, right? You guys, whatever it is in your life that you're like, I wish I could change this. Like, I wish I wasn't like this. I wish I didn't have this. I wish this wasn't my cross. I wish that 
When you look at your other friends who are like seem to you to have everything you want, do you remember like life's so easy for her. She has everything you want. When you follow your friend with her new boyfriend, you're like walking behind them, you're like, I'm gonna break their arms off, right? Like so stinking and tired of this, right? Like, look at me, I get it, right? I get it, I understand, I, I hear, I see, I've been there. But like you need to sit in this moment as the beloved daughter. And when you start knocking yourself down, right, when you start tearing yourself down, you're tearing down the crown of creation. God the Father created us last. Like hear us roar, that's where you're supposed to be like, uh-huh, uh uh-huh, yeah, right? Like do you get it? Like daughter, you are the beloved daughter. When you start feeling competition with the women around you, here's what I want you to do. When I was being bullied in seventh grade, I, I really questioned why. Like, what did I do wrong? You guys ever feel that? Like, what the heck? I never did anything to you. I always loved it when, like, junior high boys would just, like, get in a fight and punch each other and it was over. I'm like, someone just deck me, right? Like, just swing at me. I'm okay with it. I can take it. Like, quit the games. I'll take it, right? But, like, here's the deal. When you look at another woman and, and you're something, you know, whatever the drama is, remember the words of my mom. She said, Sarah, hurt people hurt people. And you know what I found? Hurt people hurt people, and healed people heal people. Amen? When someone's coming at you or you're feeling the lies or just something's up, right, there's drama, I want you to step back. And I want you to ask yourself, man, I wonder what they're hurting from so much that they feel like they have to compete with me. What's going on in their lives? And when you feel like you want to tear someone else down or you're thinking some thoughts that probably shouldn't be there about someone, step back and go, what's going on inside of me? Because I know my identity and I know my worth as a beloved daughter of God. Like Sarah told me, Steubenville, Rochester, right? Truth, truth be told, you're the beloved daughter. And what I need you to do is see yourself as that crown of creation, unique and unrepeatable, and then be the sister. Femininity, so hard to say, so good. Femininity, daughter, sister. You guys, is it hard to be a woman? It's not just me, right? My husband wrote a book, this book called John Paul II to Aristotle and back again, and I was proofreading it. And I was like, dude, you just explained junior high. Look at this. Envy is a particularly poisonous vice. It's sorrow at the good of another. It's the attitude that says, if I can't have it, I don't want anyone to have it. Envy can't stand the fact that someone is succeeding and it plays a zero sum game. If you're up, I'm down. And the only way for me to be up is for you to be down. Envy leads to intense competition among friends and members of a community. No one is happy for one another because envy is just the opposite, sorrow at the good of another. It leads to insecurity and gossip. For obvious reasons, it is toxic to friendships and destructive to community. Have you ever seen that in your life? Have you ever felt that in your life? Yeah? I think that he nailed it. We, I, we always say, if you're not careful, junior high will repeat itself over and over and over again, yes? Where are all my youth ministers at? Yeah, where are you at? Did you believe the lie like I did that like when I graduate college and get married that like all my insecurities will probably go away, yes? Did you believe the lie of like, oh, like I'm sure, like everything will just like float away and I will just like float away onto happy land, right? Like, you guys, you don't graduate from these insecurities. When you find your vocation, whether you're called to religious life or you're called to marriage or consecrated life, all of this that's coming right now is going to be with you. That envy it's really interesting. There's a difference between envy and jealousy. Listen to this. Jealousy is, I want what she has. Envy is, I want what she has and I don't want her to have it. There's a huge difference in that, yes? When I think about these different things, when I think about envy, when I think about jealousy, when I think about all those things, I really take a step back and I think about the fact that every single, I, I'm a huge fan of Cinderella. Y'all seen the new Cinderella, right? I love, I just like that movie. And you know, points for Disney. They get a couple every once in a while, right? But like, you know, like have courage and be kind. Have courage and be kind. 
is it have courage and be nice or have courage and be kind? Right? It's not have courage and be nice. Sometimes as women, we have to say the hard things. Sometimes as women, we have to stand up to our friends. One of my favorite stories about sisterhood is a very dear friend of mine in college. Um, we were really good friends, but she, it, she had this personality of, um, she was always right. And she, was, she had a tendency to one-up people or to try to make you feel small in order to make herself seem bigger. And she would say things to me that really hurt me. And again, I'm in college, right? I've like dealt with this my whole life and we're like 21 years old and finally I had been praying about it and I was like, gosh, like I, like I have to say something because I would see her do it to other people too. And you guys, I am not confrontational. Oh, I hate confrontation. Anybody else? Okay, hi, right? Like not confrontational, right? Took me about probably three months. I wrote out what I was gonna say like four times because I just was so worried about how it was gonna come across. And we went on a walk and um, I basically just told her, I was like, look, I love you. And I'm so proud of you. And I think you're beautiful. And I think you're holy. And I think you're striving for these beautiful things. But like, you hurt me when you pull me down in order to make yourself seem higher. Like, I, I explained to her, like, sometimes it feels like when you're standing on a chair, you know, or like someone's on a chair, it's a lot easier for people to pull them off the chair than for people to pull them back on the chair, right? Like, and I kind of just told her, I was like, I love you too much for our friendship to com be completely destroyed by this. And so I, I, like, I, I just wanted you to know that like, I love you, but you, this hurts me. And I, I don't want you to compete with me anymore. I don't want to compete with you anymore. And I cried and it was hard. And afterwards, she looked at me and she was like, that is all in your head. Like, I do not compete with you. Like, I'm fine and you need to figure that out. You need to figure out what's going on in your life. And I walked away from that conversation like, dang it. And we went on our separate ways, and it was a friendship, but it was definitely, it was a, it was a broken friendship, amen? Five years later, she drove seven hours to my house. We were already married with kids. She walked into my room, I mean, she told me she was coming, but she like walked into my house and she said, I am here for one reason and one reason only. And I was like, okay. She said, I am here to say that I am sorry for not acknowledging the fact that I knew I was competing with you and I knew that I was trying to tear you down to build myself up. And it's been one of the, the biggest regrets of my life. And I love you and I'm sorry. And it was probably one of those moments in my life where I will look back forever and say, just when I thought that I had totally ruined it, totally screwed it up, you guys, we're closer than we've ever been. We've been friends for over 20 years now. I wish so badly that I would have said something earlier. I wish so badly that I would have said something. And, and I don't, you never know how it's going to go, but just because it's not easy to have courage and be kind, I promise you that in the end, it's going to be worth it. And so I want you to close your eyes right now. I want you to think of the one relationship in your life that's broken. It might be with your mom. It might be with your sister, your real sister. It might be with a girl at school that you're intimidated by. It might be with someone that you're very close with, one of your best friends, and you know that they're hurting or that they hurt you, and you know that there's something in your relationship that's standing in the way from you being the best of friends. I just want you to have her face in your head because I want you to pray for her today. And if God puts it on your heart, I want you to have courage and I want you to step out in kindness because it's not easy to say that, and those words, and it's not easy to receive them. But if there's a girl in this room that you're with, youth groups are full of drama, dude, I've been there, right? Like if there's something going on in your youth group, all you have to do today is go up to them and say, hey, you know, Sarah's talk, bring it in, bring it close, bring it tight, right? You don't even have to say much. You can just say like, I need you to know that I'm sorry. Praise God if that person is in this room, right? Because that exchange is, doesn't have to be long. It can just be like, look, I'm acknowledging this. Is it hard to be a woman? Yes. I want you to take the pledge. It's a Sarah Swafford pledge. Everyone raise their right hand. I promise you, Sarah, from this day forward, I will not 
make life harder on another woman. Amen. Now look at the women around you and say, I mean it, 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 I mean it. You are beautiful. Your hair looks amazing. No, it really does. In this humidity, it's doing amazing things, right? Yes. You ready for this? Three ingredients that make a phenomenal friendship. Ready? Availability, vulnerability, accountability. Shoot me now, we hate them all. Did you hear it? Who threw up in their mouth? No, I'm just kidding. Okay. Availability, vulnerability, and accountability. Availability. The greatest gift you could give a sister right now is to put your phone away and give her the gift of your eyeballs. Amen? I am Oregon Trail generation. Father Johnny and sister, we're all Oregon Trail. We're geriatric millennials. Yes. I didn't grow up with a phone, but like the number one pet peeve in my life is the smart, the smart watches, the Apple phones, the Apple watches. Like I'm literally sharing my heart and people are like, I'm like, oh, are we having burritos tonight? What are we eating? Are we going to Chipotle? I'm ready to go, right? Like I'm wondering what's on the phone, right? Like the greatest gift that you can give anyone in your life right now is your availability to put your phone away. I have some, some people, uh, when I was in Australia, they have this thing where when they go out to dinner, there's a group of guys and girls, when they go to dinner, they put their phones in the middle, face down, in the middle of the table. And the first person to reach for their phone pays the bill. Yes, right? Yes? It may take a lot of cookie dough or a lot of chicken wings or whatever it is that is your, what is your groove, but I need you to get together and I need you to be available to one another, Amen. And then I need you to be vulnerable with, it, with one another. It's not, are you struggling? It's what are you struggling with today, this hour, in this moment. Amen? And then the last one is the hardest one. It's accountability. If you want to watch your friendships just absolutely go to the next level, it's accountability. It's the hardest one. I have two stories that I love for this. One is one of my best friends in, in college. She had a huge conversion, and her dad was an alcoholic, and they had a really, really broken relationship, and it took us all of college to kind of figure out just how to navigate that relationship. And there was one point during our conversion where she realized that one of the things that she did was because she couldn't control her dad, she liked lording control over men. So she liked to play emotional games with their heart. She liked to make out with guys at parties and then drop them just so she could feel power over them. Does that make sense? And there was a particular guy, we were roommates, and there was a particular guy that she had an emotional connection. I wrote a book called Emotional Virtue, right? There's a lot of this was stuff I lived in college, right? And this particular story was something that I was like, whoa. Because she was using him emotionally. She was the guy that he, she, would, he would, she would text at 11 o'clock at night, like, hey, what are you doing, right? When she needed to be emotionally affirmed, she sent that text. She would go on these, like, walks with him. She would do all, I mean, it was very emotional, and I knew that there was no commitment. She was, there was, she was not committed to him and she was not dating him and she was not going to date him. This was a control thing. Does that make sense? Nod your head up and down if that makes sense, yes? And so there was this, this breakthrough moment where she looked at me. We were actually on a retreat. It was after adoration. So tonight, availability, vulnerability, accountability, yes? It was after adoration. We were in college and she looked at me and she said, if I ever leave at night Late at night, and you don't know where I'm going, ask me where I'm going. Call me out. Because you know where I'm going, so call me out. And I said, okay. And so it was like a Thursday night, weeks later. I'm sitting on the couch. I had my computer out. I'll never forget it. I was just like working on paper or something. And all of a sudden, here she comes, looking real cute, right? It's like 1130, coming out the door, looking really cute. Hand on the doorknob. And I was like, hey. Right? non-confrontational pants right here, right? I was like, hey, 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 right? Where are you going, right? And she turned around, she looked at me, and she was like, it's none of your business. And I was like, okay, right? And then she shut the, she slammed the door, walked out, was gone for like 15 minutes, and I'm sitting at my computer like, great. This is going to take a lot of cookie dough. Right? Like, I was just like, ugh. And so she, like, I'm just sitting at my computer trying to figure out, like, how, what, okay, well, I, tr I tried. I did what I was supposed to do, whatever. And then I'm sitting at my computer. All of a sudden, like, 15 minutes later, the door, our dorm room flies open. And she comes running in and jumps on my lap and, like, holds me like a ch small child. Right? 
And I was like, and she looked at me and she, she said, thank you. She's like, thank you. And then she looked at me and she said, I don't hate you. I love you. And I needed that. And it was a slow roll. Amen? You guys, conversion is a slow roll. Restoration is a slow roll. Every single one of us up here, right? Like, God just continues to take us deeper and deeper and takes us closer and closer into his sacred heart. Just, that's my whole, my whole conversion. Like, I, I was, I love sharing my testimony with you guys, but I have, like, six conversion stories, right? Like, the one when I became a mom, the one that I, be, like, the one happening right now, right? Like, I have all of these conversion stories because the Lord is just taking you deeper and deeper and deeper. And you know what? I wouldn't be standing on this stage if it wasn't for that group of women that walked with me. I mean it. When I was in college, you guys, like, I knew that if I was going to make it, like, as I was running to heaven, right, like, as I was running... I knew that I was going to, I knew I was going to have to, I mean, you know, you're like running towards, towards the Lord and you like glance to the side, see who's running with you. And you're like, I hope it's a cute boy, but it was like a bunch of girls. Right. And I was like, okay, no cute boy, just a bunch of broken women. And they're like, welcome. Hotmess.com. Just bring it on in. Right. Like, and I remember thinking to myself, anybody but women, because I don't trust women as far as I can throw them. Amen. Do I exaggerate? Do you trust women? Do you trust the women in your life? I heard no's. Daughter, sister, you will not make it in this life without sisters in Christ. Amen? Good. That's a youth minister clapping, okay? Because everybody knows that you are not going to make it in this life without sisterhood. So find your crew, find your tribe, find your posse, get a hashtag and a t-shirt, and start running together. Yes? Yes. Okay. Good. Mother. Oh, it's really beautiful to get to talk about motherhood with a bunch of high school beautiful women, okay? But here's where I'm going to go with this. The woman's soul is fashioned as a shelter in which other souls may unfold. One more time. The woman's soul is fashioned as a shelter in which other souls may unfold. This is why I'm so glad Steubenville gave me the other three and a half hours that I need, right? So when I think of motherhood, I think of obviously first my, my five kids, right? Like I think of I am a mother, right, biologically. But when I think of motherhood and like the crown of creation and beauty, I think of Our Lady, yes? I think about all the moms that I know they are just rocking it, right? Like I, I, I hang out, I live across the street from 2,000 college students. So when girls see me, they're like, Oh my gosh, Sarah, I just, I love your family. I just, I just can't wait to be a mom. I have like 16 kids, right? Like they're like so excited. And then like in the same, like as I'm being like, oh yeah, I'm like, I love it. It's so great. And then all of a sudden I'm like, I can smell like vomit from where like the baby spit up down my back. And they're like, you're just so cute and great. I'm like, great. Could you grab a wet wipe and wipe my back off? That'd be great. Yeah, I can smell. It's in my hair actually. Yeah, right behind my ear, Right. Like when I think of motherhood, like I think of this beauty and this offering. I could go on like f literally for hours about the beauty of motherhood. And I think about obviously like mothers that I hang with, like motherhood, right? But like the very next image that I get is Sister Miriam. Like the very next image that I get are the handmaids that are running around. Like this unbelievable, undeniable gift of spiritual motherhood. They're, I mean, sister's a mother to me. Sister's a sister to me. I look to her, right? Like, I just want you guys to feel this. I want you to hold this up because I think sometimes when we think motherhood, we think like, I, I'm just going to go out. I, I'm going to say what I think. I think that people think like cute strollers and like Starbucks and like Baby Gap, right? Like, it's like this cute, like motherhood is like this cute thing on Pinterest. Does that make sense? And I just want you to hear me say this very clearly. The greatest gift that I ever received from our Lord was the gift of motherhood in the sense that it completely stripped me of self. We would never choose that, would we? Any vocation that you walk into, God is he's preparing you guys. Like I know all of you, up, all of you sitting here right now are like, when I tell you, like, look, the get, like singleness, like the fact that you're single, right? You don't have a big V vocation yet, right? Like you might be dating someone, but like you're single. You guys, that is a gift. 
I know that you want to like throw tomatoes at me and be like, girl, this ain't a gift. Sit down. Get it. You know what I mean? Like I understand the like, I am so lonely. Like you have no idea. Like I understand that. But I want you to, I want you to receive this. God is preparing you for motherhood, biological or spiritual. And the way he's preparing you for that is as a daughter and a sister. The woman's soul is a place for someone to come and unfold. You get knocked around and you get made fun of because of your emotions, because you care too much, because you feel too much, because you're all over the place. You know what I have to say to that? I have to say to that, the emotions, the feelings, the beauty, the nurturing, the care, the sensitivity, that is your crowning, of, that's, that is the crown of creation. That is what God made you for. One of my favorite things to think about is, you know when you're like, all of you, you like beat, beat yourself up physically, right? Like your body. Did you know that women carry 10% more body fat than men? Because in a famine, we could feed everyone. One more time. You will forever carry 10% more body fat than a man. So if you're 10 pounds heavier than you want, just embrace that. Just embrace that, right? I'm kidding. But do you guys, do you see what I'm saying? Like, you are the crown of creation. You get made fun of for your curves, for being soft, right? You get made fun of for being soft of heart, for being tender. You guys, those are some of your greatest attributes. The Lord created you that way, and I want you to embrace that. Does that make sense? When I, my wounds of dismissal and rejection from junior high was I always felt like I was either too much or not enough. Do you feel that? So-and-so thinks I'm too much, so-and-so thinks I'm not enough. Life is too short to not be authentically who you are, amen? Striving for virtue, striving for holiness, striving for all the things, obviously going after beauty and goodness and truth and virtue, like get it girl, right? But when you get lost and you forget who you are, I want you to look right here. Our lady is the embodiment, embodiment of all three. She was daughter, she is daughter, sister, and mother. And she's so beautifully mother because she had Jesus, yes, biologically had Jesus, yeah, mother of God, hi, what's up? But she was also mother to the apostles. Amen? Do you think Mary was a, a safe place for the apostles to come and unfold in her heart? You guys embrace that. And if someone makes fun of you for it, if someone makes fun of your femininity, I literally want you in your head, maybe not, you know, but I want you to just be like, uh-huh, great, thanks. Crown of creation over here. Don't really care what you think, right? Don't say it out loud because that's bad, right? But like in your head, I want you to say like, oh, that's great. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry you feel that way. Um, my vocation as a, a daughter and sister and mother, however my vocation plays out, like this is going to be what God created me for. And I'm going to tap into that and I'm going to foster that because I am a woman, because I am feminine and I am beautiful. And then from there, we surrender and strive. This is one of my favorite. Surrender and strive is just one of my things. I absolutely love it. Um, I get stuck on the strive stuff sometimes, right? Like, isn't it? It's hard sometimes, right? Because you're just like, I got to be this. I got to be this. I got to be this. I got to do this. I got to fix that. I got to change that. I got to lose that 10 pounds. And then I'll present myself to God. I'll present myself to others and be like, am I enough? But it's all about this surrender, you guys. There is a deep surrender that we need to the Lord where we say, I come to you. Place your hand out like this, right? Put your hand out like this. Come to the Lord with open hands, not clench fists. Clench your fist. You hold so tightly to what you think is going to make you happy. You hold so tightly to what you think you need to look like. You, you hold so tightly to who you think you need to be with. You hold so tightly because you're afraid that you're not enough. If God the Father wanted to put new beauty into your hand, could he? Our Lord cannot put new beauty into clenched fists. He can only put new beauty into open hands. Amen? So that's surrender. It's coming to the Lord and saying, I can't do this on my own and I don't want to do this on my own. I give you control. I told you earlier, I'm the only girl in my family. I'm the oldest child. I'm a perfectionistic people pleaser. Right? Like therapy later. Right? Like I have a hard time with this. 
I don't want you to live your life with clenched fists. I want you to live your life with open hands. And that's the surrender. And the striving comes from, Lord God, I know who I am. I'm not confident in like myself, like I can do this. I am woman, hear me roar. I am confident in your love for me as the beloved daughter. And I'm the beloved sister that's coming to be and walk with the women in my life. And I'm a, a mother to the people around me because I want to be a safe place where they can unfold, where they can be themselves, where they can come to me for the availability, vulnerability, and accountability piece that we so desperately need. Amen? I want to read from, I want to read a little something for, from this book that I really, really like. Um, you guys might know him. His name is Father John Burns. Yeah, have you met him? Yes. Um, Father Johnny is like a brother to me, and he's like a brother to my husband and I, and we really just, honestly, sometimes there's people that come into your life, and they just speak truth to your heart. Amen? I'm going to get emotional just talking about him. He just speaks truth to your heart. His homily today was exactly what you needed to hear. Amen? I really encourage you to go back and watch these talks on when you can go back on YouTube and watch them, okay? But, like, I just want you to take everything from this weekend. I just want you to let it, like, settle in. Because there's a lot being said. There's a lot that's going to get thrown at you. But just, like, take it in. And he wrote this book called Lift Up Your Heart. And I, I remember reading it. And I, I remember thinking, like, this, this book changed the way I pray. And so there's a couple, like, just a couple paragraphs that I want to read to you. And so I want you to just let this wash over you, okay? Close your eyes. Close your eyes. Imagine God as a sculptor. Each person is a unique, unfinished work of art. If we admit this image, inevitably questions arise about what it would take to complete and beautify the work. We can see how easily we impose our own ideas on the process of completion. Frequently, we set about in a frantic haste to embellish to hasten toward finality, to add our own finishing touches, and to adorn ourselves as we see best. We want to be attractive to behold. We want to stand out from the crowd, to attract the interest and the notice of others. We convince ourselves that this will somehow make us happy. We seek jewels and adornments, but we seek them not for the sake of beauty. We want to have and to have more, to let others know we have more, so that rather than our wishing we had better lives, they could look at us and wish their lives were better. When we slip into this mode, we miss the fundamentals. Of how much, of much greater importance is it to see the foundation, the sculpture itself, and to see it as unfinished. In prayer, we must work to recognize that a loving master sculptor has crafted each person uniquely. By design, no two works of the sculptor are ever the same. Rather than chasing after embellishments, a better starting point lies in two related questions. How can I best adorn the face of creation? And how can I best reflect the genius of the sculptor and thereby shine the splendor of God into the hearts of all those who come into my life? Perhaps not the first questions that come to mind, but they bring us into harmony with the mind of the Almighty. Take a deep breath in and let it out, right? You are unfinished, and that is okay. It's okay to be a work of, you know, a masterpiece and a work in progress at the same time. Amen? I want to finish with this. I want to I end with this. I love you. You know how much I love you. And I also love all the men that are eating lunch somewhere outside of this place. Amen? I love those men. I was watching the Fargo group. Where's Fargo? Are you guys here? Fargo? I love Fargo. I was watching Fargo go to communion, and I was praying, and I was singing, and I just watched all these, like, like high school guys, like, receive our Lord. And I was thinking about how much I love my brothers in Christ. Like, I, think about, I was thinking about how much I love, the, like, the guys in my life that walk with me. And I re was thinking back to when I was in college, I had a, a really strong group of guy friends. Um, and it was the first time in my life that I ever had good Catholic guy friends. And I remember it hit me really hard one time where I was like, man, I love those guys. And I was listening to them talk about their battle, listening to them talk about things they struggle with, listening to them talk about just what it's like to be a guy. It's not easy to be a woman. Not really easy to be a guy right now either, amen? Masculinity is under attack. That is real. In the same way femininity is under attack, masculinity is really under attack. And we have a role to play, amen? We can either, I mean, 
I'm gonna be really honest with you. When you look across at a group of men, high school guys, college guys, whatever guys you look across and you see a group of guys, I want you to say to yourself, I will never understand their battle, but I respect it. And I don't wanna be an obstacle to their holiness. I wanna elevate these men. I wanna be there for them. I don't know what God's calling them to. They might, God might be calling them to priesthood. God might be calling them to be a, a husband and a father to like one of my best girlfriends. And like I want to help them get to there. Amen? I want to make them the men that God is calling them to be because they are loved and they are enough and they are worthy. All the things that I'm telling you, they're going to hear later because they need to hear that too. Amen? I need you to be with me in this fight to elevate the men, right? And I need you to be with me this weekend to encourage them, to praise them to cheer them on, because it all goes back to that restoration, to the original, to what the original is, amen? When Adam and Eve were in the garden, what did you hear, the word, one of my favorite words in the Bible is helpmate. Adam needed a helpmate, amen? The animals were cute, not a helpmate, right? Not a helpmate, I need a helpmate, I need someone to run with towards heaven. My husband said to me when we were engaged, he's like, look, I love you, but I'm gonna fail you because I'm not perfect and I can't be your everything. And so he told me, he said, I wanna run towards the Lord. I don't wanna run at each other, I wanna run with each other. And I will always point you to the one who is your everything. That's what I want for your relationships. That's what I want for your friendships because you, we're the helpmate, amen? Adam, his first, when he saw Eve, the first thing, I mean, he was seeking someone to be his helpmate to run with him. The first experience Eve had was a man beholding her as beautiful as enough, as lovely. And then the fall. Jesus steps in and says, I want to bring you back to that place where you can come to me and I see you and I call you beautiful and I call you enough. That's what he's saying to you in the Eucharist, tonight in adoration. He's saying, bring it back. Let me restore you. All the lies, the fall, all the sin, all the lies. Let No, I'm restoring you to the original, yes? I want to bring Father Johnny up to pray over you guys. He's here, why not, right? I mean, come on, right? Like, he has a heart like nothing else. And one of the things that I always like to talk about, because with Father and I, with our friendship, is why did, why did God take Eve from the rib of Adam? Why didn't he just take her, take her from like the big toe or like the elbow or like the really attracted femur, right? Like we don't know why he chose from the rib. But I heard someone say it once that the reason why God chose the rib is because that is exactly where God always wanted woman. Close to man's heart, by his side and under his arm. Amen? Love you, Father Johnny, right? Like this is where... This is where we belong as helpmates, amen? So when you go back to the guys in your, in your youth group, be like, this isn't awkward. I'm just going to stand by you for a moment, okay? It's fine, right? I'm here for your holiness. Be here all day, right? Like, I want you to walk in friendship. I want you to walk in friendship with the men in your life. I pray for this guy every day. I adopted him for life because the devil hates him. And I take it as a total compliment to be friends with him and to pray for him. The devil hates the men in your life. They, he hates the masculinity that they try to portray. Amen? Are you with me in this fight? Yes. Now here we go. I believe in the power of the Holy Spirit, and I believe in the power of him to heal. So I want you to pray. I'm going to have Father pray over you, but I want you to maybe open your hand, and then I want you to take your other hand, and I want you to place it on the shoulder of the woman next to you, the girl next to you. I want you to pray for yourself, but I, want you, I also want you to pray for the girl next to you. If you're on the end, reach forward, I guess, or backwards. Someone, I'll pray for you if you're on an end and you don't have anybody. I'm up here. I got you, okay? Everybody take a deep breath in. I want you to close your eyes. I want you to think about just the daughter, the sister, and the mother that you are. And I'm going to let Father just pray over you. Let his words really sink into your heart. 